Welcome everybody to the Houdini 20 keynote presentation. Over the next two hours, we're gonna show you the latest and greatest in Houdini and we're really excited to show that to you. But first, I wanna talk about something even more important and that's people. The last few years have been really uh, challenging and stressful for a lot of us. But for film and TV, it's been extra stressful for the last few months. And if you're in that category, we're uh, sincerely hoping you're doing well. We, uh, we hope you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, we hope you get back to production as quickly as possible. The Houdini community is filled with incredible people. Warm, generous, professional, and uh, whether you're a, you're a Houdini artist working in a studio, or an indie artist, or an educator, or a student, uh, the passion and, and uh, work that you create every single day inspires us. We love you for it. Some of the ways that we, uh, that we strengthen the community, one way is through Houdini Hives. Uh, we create these events so that people can come together, ideally in person, ideally, uh, and artists can educate each other. Um, we've done 12 Houdini Hives in 2023, resulting in 92 educational presentations uh, done by some of the most incredible Houdini artists sharing their knowledge. It's a heck of a lot of work putting those presentations together, and we really appreciate it on behalf of the community. All of those are available on sidefx.com today. We've also invested in 15 educational large-scale projects on a variety of subjects from uh, uh, lighting, layout, look dev, game environments, tool building, AI, uh, and a whole bunch more. They're available on sidefx.com as well. The artist directory, we just launched this artist directory where it has the goal of uh, having artists be able to connect better with each other and also with studios that might be looking for talent wherever they happen to be. And finally, we are in the last stages of launching Singapore, uh, our office there. And uh, we look forward to being able to support our Asia Pacific customers even better than ever. We have an event coming up on December 4th to 8th. It's a five day VFX bootcamp and uh, details are available on sidefx.com. So let's jump into Houdini 20. And to help us do that, I'd like to introduce our VP of product development, Kristen Bergiel. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for helping us celebrate this major milestone in the life of side effects in Houdini. It's really a big one, um, and we always stand behind every release that we've put out, and this one is no different in typical side effects fashion. Uh, we've crafted Houdini 20 with the same vision and the same keen focus on the needs of our community. Uh, you guys, a community that's uh, getting larger and more diversified uh, by every passing year. So we're super pleased and super proud to celebrate this, this milestone. Um, but it really, it's, it's not the 2-0 that's the big deal here. It's, it's definitely a, a nice round number, um, but it wouldn't mean much if it wasn't for everything that went into it. And I'm really happy to tell you that uh, what's really special about this release is, again, not the number, it's the sheer number and the breadth and the depth of features that it brings forth. It's the massive number of development arcs, some of them coming to fruition and some of them just taking flight in Houdini 20. By our own standards of software innovation, uh, Houdini 20 is by far the largest release ever. All right. So let's talk quickly about some of those development arcs. Um, the first one I want to mention, uh, among those that are coming to fruition, so they're expressing our vision in a more complete way. Of course, more development <laughs> is to come, uh, is not stopping in, in any way. But one of these arcs is CFX, uh, which sees the release of muscles in gold this time around. And then for grooming, it sees the release of an end-to-end -end feathering pipeline, which is bound to be an instant classic. Uh, I mean, just 
check out this bird behind me. Um, it's, it's, it's really impressive uh, what uh, our R&D people are able to do with that. Uh, another arc uh, worth mentioning is um, looking now at new things that we are starting right now uh, is Vulcan. Uh, Vulcan sets the stage for something big. It's incipient in Houdini 20, it's just experimental, but the plan for it is to give you an you know, order of magnitude uh, performance increase, much greater visual quality, and also to represent the basis of a new real-time cinematic render one day to go head-to-head -head with Karma XPU and CPU. And speaking of the XPU, I'm enormously proud and pleased to tell you that in Houdini 20, Houdini XPU is going gold. And it wouldn't uh, be fair to end my list of, of new arcs without mentioning character, rigging and animation. Uh, this is one of the hardest projects that we've worked on. It's inspired by animators, driven by animators. It's Houdini like you haven't seen it before. And we're very proud to introduce it to you today. And I will say, given the sheer amount of new stuff that, that comes with that project. It absolutely, unapologetically sets the theme and the tone of this release. Yeah. All right, I do have one more arc I need to talk about. I must talk about this one, and I'm no, I know you're all thinking it. So an arc that will, that's starting this, this year, the foundation is in place. We've done some work. We have some examples to show you that are very cool. Can you guess? Machine learning? <laughs> All right, so we're stepping into that arena absolutely solidly and formally and will be there forever now. So we believe that it will gradually touch every fiber in the fabric of Houdini. Um, but I have to say some Important things, I think, from our standpoint as we start that, that endeavor. One, ML will complement proceduralism, will not replace it. We stand by proceduralism and we believe the two of them together could be fantastic, but one replacing the other or ignoring the other would be wrong, incorrect, and if I might say, naive. So that's, that's the first thing. Secondly, everything ML that comes from this company, you can trust to be 100% ethically sourced. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, we get very excited as technology people, but we don't fall for hype that easily. So expect that everything that we do with ML, and there's a lot out there, there's a lot of good critical mass there, will be chosen and curated carefully. So where and how and when things land into Houdini will be thought out very, very carefully. Okay, and always leading with foundation and then features. So how about features? How about solving ML problems? We believe more in specialized solutions than generalized ones. And we also believe in giving you all our tools, all our scripts, all our know-how so that you can apply that specialization to the things that you need to do. And again, you'll see that twice today, first at the beginning and, and then at the end of our presentation. So that's very important to say um, as well. So I don't wanna belabor this. I sh I'm sure you're all waiting to see the cool stuff, um, but I needed to tell you that we are now solidly on the path of machine learning. We'll be talking about it every time from now on. Uh, but for now, we have a big, big, big show. We have four big, big chapters. And the first one, and possibly the most important one, uh, certainly given the amount of work that's gone into it, will be introduced by my colleague, Rob Stoffer. Please welcome him onto the stage. Thank you, Kristen. So we have lots of really great stuff to share with you guys tonight. Um, over the last several versions, we've started down the path of character effects and animation. We started introducing things like vellum cloth, hair and fur, better grooming tools, and things like that. And of course, muscles, which as Kristen mentioned, are production ready with this release. We also went down the path of improving our animation tools. That started with kin effects uh, for things like motion editing and motion retargeting. 
But with Houdini 20, we really focused on the animator in terms of a of workflow and performance and providing a dedicated animation environment. So let's start diving in. Um, to start off, I'm gonna introduce the mastermind behind our Feather Tools, Kai. Thank you, Rob, and hey, everyone, it's great to be here. Uh, let's jump right into it. We have a lot to get through. Uh, so uh, Feathers, as we all know, it's still one of the biggest challenges in production, definitely in character pipelines and for character artists. Uh, every single feather is quite a complex entity and made up of lots of little elements, takes up memory, is difficult to manage. Um, we know that a lot of you have tackled these, these challenges successfully, um, but there were just limits on what you could achieve with usability and performance uh, when you had to represent every single detail with a geometry curve in SOMS. So with Houdini 20, we try to address both these issues. First, by making feathers, each individual feather, a single entity that you can easily select and transform using standard tools. So you no longer need specialized tools just to make sure that barbs follow along, you know, the branching curves that you have on the feathers. So also, performance takes a huge jump. The barb data, um, every single point that you have there, is stored in a format that's ideal for GPU consumption. So um, processing performance and viewport performance have taken a huge leap forward. Uh, but these are still not packed primitives, so nothing is hidden away from you. You can go in at any point, select points on the shaft curve, manipulate those. There's nothing stopping you from going in and grooming these things directly. And uh, all the bar points that you see there can be individually manipulated, right? So we have a suit of tools to do that, but you can also take a wrangle sop as you're used to and go right in there and manipulate everything that's there. All the stuff is unique, no instancing tricks. Uh, creating an individual feather couldn't be any easier. All the tools are built around working directly in the viewport, so you don't have like a long list of ramps as you may have seen in uh, other places. Uh, you simply draw a shaft curve, some outline curves, and then optionally some additional profile curves to define how the barbs flow along the feather. Of course, a full groom takes quite a lot of these templates, and sometimes they just have small variations. Uh, we speed up the process of their creation tremendously by uh, letting you create some principal example feathers that you then interpolate. And in this case, we also assign uh, some primitive attributes like clump frequency and noise amplitude on the principal templates that we then blend across. And this is just information that's used by later operators. It's all as flexible as you would expect. So once you have all your feathers, um, detailing them and you know, working on them in detail uh, is a, can be a laborious task, but it's made easy now by these procedural operators which support uh, attribute overrides as well as texture mask overrides for every single parameter. So the easiest way of accomplishing this task is you lay everything out flat and you work on everything all at once, which is super straightforward now. Here we're using the new texture mask paint tool which I'm sure all character artists especially are very glad to see. Uh, and we're making full use of that throughout the tools and throughout the software now. Of course, this is a huge part of the grooming process, painting density masks, masks and all kinds of masks. Yeah, so you just do that directly in the viewport now. No need to go to third party applications or you know, subdi subdividing the geometry to crazy levels just to get uh, your texture resolution that you need with uh, something like Atrip Paint, which we had to do before. To create the actual feather groom, uh, you basically use the tools that you're already used to, but of course we have several additions uh, to facilitate the creation of feathers specifically. So uh, tools for orienting feathers, uh, tools for assigning feather templates, you know, the individual feather type to different parts of the groom. But maybe the biggest change that is very apparent here is the improved uh, guide interpolation. So we have a method that uses biharmonic weights on a separately generated, dynamically generated mesh to compute these things. And you see that I'm able to use a very, very sparse set of guides to define the overall flow of the groom. But then it's also very natural and easy to go into more detailed areas, add more guides there. And the transition from the sparse to the, to the detailed happens totally naturally without a lot of tweaking of parameters or any tweaking of parameters, really. Once you get to adding the renderable detail to the groom, uh, you'll still use the same operators that I showed before, like uh, the feather clumping, barb clumping, and noise operators. And all of these are totally designed to work on a full groom or like very substantial subsections of it in real time. 
They're all fully GPU accelerated. So things like tweaking the parameters on those and, and uh, painting masks like you're seeing here can all be done in real time with real time feedback. Uh, making sure that feathers de-intersect is a huge part of the process and has been a challenge. So Houdini comes with a fully GPU accelerated advanced uh, de-intersection algorithm that you see me using right here. Also, I'm using the new uh, Houdini HUD controls directly here to, uh, to show me changing the duration count and blending it over. And you can see it cleans up this initially fairly messy thing very, very uh, cleanly. And again, this is all happening at interactive update rates. And the results that you see here, this one as well, they've all been obtained by just tweaking basic parameters on the node with little setup time. Uh, but you can, of course, go into more detail. You can supply uh, layer priority attributes or neighbor, di neighbor arrays directly. So in the most extreme case, you can only use the geometric the intersection part of this node. Once we have our groom, uh, it's very straightforward to convert the feathers to polygon surfaces or other representations, and then also do resampling. So you can decide the resolution that you need for simulation or kin effects rigging separately from the groom resolution, obviously. And then transferring that motion back is done with a feather deform SOP, which uses a subdivision um, algorithm, subdivision surface algorithm. So the deformation is always smooth, even if you only have like three segments on the feather. So it's all independent and the deformation quality will, will still be there. Um, this is a look at our Vulkan viewport, which is currently hidden behind an NFAR, uh, but is available to you in Houdini 20. With that, you'll see another huge jump in performance. So all the other slides I've shown so far and everything in the rest of the presentation is the OpenGL viewport. But here you see me manipulating this 62 million point groom uh, in real time in the viewport while tweaking parameters and having some of those operators compute um, noise, some procedural noise on that. And even in this, I can go in, you know, look at some, some of those smaller feathers, select them and transform them. You'll also find that rendering these feathers with Karma and especially Karma XPU is incredibly fast. I was actually blown away while using this. Um, you can expand these feathers to, to full SOP curves and import that directly into LOPS. It's all very straightforward. Uh, but if you're going to render animated sequences, you're going to want to use the feather procedural we pro provide, which uses a um, single frame of the groom and these lightweight polygon surface deformers. So disk, uh, disk space and I.O. footprint on the farm is minimal. And here we have a look at some render statistics, which you'll show off, uh, which, which you'll see more of later. And it's important to note that, that all the look dev we've done and all the rendering we've done was with LOPS and Karma XPU. And here are just some additional really nice renders of the eagle uh, by Andrei Belichenko. And with that, let me hand over to Warren, who will talk about uh, animation. Thank you, everyone. Um, so let's take a look at our new, uh, uh, brand, brand new animation uh, environment for Houdini 20, which includes physics such as um, Ragdoll and uh, Dynamic Motion, uh, all with a viewport-centric uh, uh, workflow for animators. So as you can see here, I will be, as I just mentioned, doing everything in the viewport. But I also want to mention our new uh, selection set HUD. But it's more than selection sets, it's also display groups, and it's also uh, channel groups. So you can decide what controls you want to show, what characters you want to show, and when you pin the sets, then you're guaranteed to be uh, keying everything that you needed in that set. And then the third thing I want to mention is something you can't see me do. And what that's going to be is using uh, Control Shift, and it's our new volatile hotkey. And this will allow us to rotate um, and translate uh, controls around any pivot. So let me show you what that means. And here we have Electra, and she's just got IK arms and legs. Uh, there's no FK on them. So if we wanted to rotate the arms, move the arms together with the hips, generally they'll rotate around their own axes, or they'll translate um, along the orientation from rigging. But now when we hold Control Shift, this allows us to move the groups around that pivot, moving them all together. So we can translate them, rotate them, move them in any axis, and they all go together. 
This also allows us to use other things as pivots. And in this case, I'm just going to turn on some uh, display here. And these aren't typical controls. They don't actually deform the character at all. They're just exposing the pivot of the joints for me to use. So if I wanted to raise this arm up, instead of translating it, now I can select the shoulder as a pivot, and I can rotate it naturally up. I can rotate it forward, and I can select the elbow and rotate it around there. So effectively, I'm using our um, posing our IK handle in an FK manner. And here I've just set up a set doing the exact same thing, so I can quickly grab it, um, doing the exact same thing of rotating it around, rotating it around the knee. We can even use the pole vector and use that to rotate the IK foot around. And again, all the while still maintaining all the functionality of just an IK leg going on. This also allows us to move large groups of controls around together. So really quickly, we can invert Electra around, and then if we wanted to put our hand down, and if we wanted to, um, say, balance her on our finger, we could turn on the finger controls, and since they are controls, that means there's a pivot, that means we can rotate everything around it. And really quickly, now we can make Electra balance on our fingertip. Or if we want to switch it and we want to dangle her from her foot, we can just select the foot and now rotate it around there all without needing any fancy rigging or uh, switches needed. And then the last thing I want to introduce here is our new G key. And this, uh, what this will do is when you bring, uh, select a handle, um, it'll bring up the values there. You can adjust them with the, slot, with the ladder, or um, you can copy and paste the keys. In this case, I'm just going to grab everything and reset Electra back to default. So since the character is built with uh, many pivots uh, already in it, in its rig, we should be able to use them. But what if we need another uh, pivot that's not part of the uh, character? Let's take a look at that next. So here we have the simplest of rigs. It's just a point just to move the chair around. But I want to do more than that. So if we hold down B, we have a new radial menu for our animation tools, and we can go into the locator tool. And from here, I just drop down a couple of locators that I can use, and we can go back out to animation, and now I can use them as pivots, so really easily I can tilt the chair backwards or forwards. So very straightforward, very simple, but let's add Electra to the chair. And now we have Electra in there, and I've just created a couple of sets again, and I have a tilt back and a tilt forward. So now when I select this, I can rotate Electra and the chair together, and there's no constraints in there, it's just how we're moving the groups of controls uh, together. And we also have uh, the tilt forward set. And um, in this case, I just didn't include the feet. So now when you tilt it forward, they just stay uh, flat on the ground. But you could shift select them, add them into it, and they'll rotate as well. So you can add and remove as necessary for this. And so using this, I just did an animation of uh, Electra rocking back and forward, sitting down and standing up. And now if I wanted to do a breakdown between some keys, uh, this would be a good time to introduce our new animation sliders. And as you can see, there's way too many there to go through in this short amount of time. So uh, we'll just go over a couple of them that I, I use mostly. Um, but it's fully customizable. You can decide what sliders you want where. In this case, I'm just going to go and make it extra wide just so we could see it a little bit easier. And again, we have our two keys. We have our key to the left, key to the right. And if we want to just blend uh, to the neighbor, now just dragging the slider left or right, we're now favoring those sides. And if you hold Shift, you can now uh, overshoot those keys as well. So really quickly, just using a slider, we've now got our breakdown pose, um, moving the characters all together at once. The next one I use all the time is um, blending to a frame. And I love this because I know that on frame one, Electra is sitting, and at frame 50, she's standing. So quickly, just by selecting her set, now I can just make her sit down or stand up or anywhere in between. Again, really, really quickly, just moving a slider without needing to uh, move all those controls at once. And we have a quick breakdown pose to continue on. So next, I want to talk about one of the first things an animator will do when they get a shot is get their reference. And so I just went out back and I just shot a video of myself doing a little pole thrust. So now I have some reference for how I will go about animating that shot. But I wanted more information, so I shot another video of myself on the side but I don't have a two camera setup, obviously, so they're not timed up properly. Now we could do a lot, uh, it, now we can trim the shot, we can uh, offset the start frame, but in this case, I'm just gonna change the speed, and really quickly, now I can line up that pole, so now we have the thrust uh, working out, and now I have more information, so I can look at my poses for more angles, 
more reference to do it. Uh, so a really good quality of life, being able to animate our, or being able to edit our video reference right in our viewports. So next, uh, uh, this is just a three character setup. Uh, there's no constraints in this. Again, we're just gonna be doing it um, by using the pivots and the sets. And you can see really quickly, I can move all the groups of the characters together, working up the chain, just uh, starting through each character. And you can see they're all still maintaining their contacts, again, with no constraints. So you can really easily get your pose done through this. And way faster than posing individual uh, controls one at a time. And again, your slider still works, so you can still do your breakdowns in between there um, with all the characters still maintaining their contacts. So here's another example. You could set it up as a constraint uh, system with complicated releases and grabs and what's driving what. But again, I'm not bothering to use any constraints here, but I could still use any pivot I want. So I can rotate anything together from the front hand. I can rotate everything together from the back hand. I can use the pole as uh, moving everything together. And I've added two locators at the front and the back. And we can also use those to rotate as needed. And if we want to move it all around uh, from the hips and keep everything, really quickly we can rotate everything together. So instead of dealing with a complex uh, constraint setup, I can just do it with posing really quickly. Now I've talked a lot about not using constraints for doing everything, but let me show you an example of where I have used constraints. And if you can see the screen left hand, I've just deleted some keys so we can obviously see it's leaving the pole. But um, now we want to attach it back to the pole. So we can go into our constraint tool, and if we select the driven and the driver and we hit H, you can see the control turns gray, we know it's constrained, and now when we scrub through, the hand is perfectly locked on. But let's set a key on that uh, control, and what we have is our new HUD for constraints, and there's a few options in here, but one of them is enable constraints. So really quickly, we can enable and disable the constraint, so where it's constrained, where it's not, where it's constrained, where it's not. And what this allows us to do is when it's on the constraint, we could just set a key on that uh, control. And now when we disable it, it's locked on the pole entirely. So again, and we can go down to a different frame um, and do the exact same thing. So we could change the frame. We have it locked on. We set a key on the control and then we disable the control, the uh, constraint. And now we have it all locked on. But if you wanted it to be every frame on there again, you can just drag on the timeline what you want, the range that you want, and then bake the range. And now again, disabling the uh, constraint, now we have everything locked on, but not having to deal with the constraint anymore. So uh, really powerful to get, uh, instead of setting up your system of uh, the constraint driving everything, now we're posing as normal and using constraints just to do corrections where needed. All right, let's get into some uh, dynamics. Um, but the first thing I want to mention here is this is just a little work in progress. You can see there's lots of issues with speed ups and slowdowns, but you can see the colored bars down at the bottom. And this is our new uh, animation bookmarks. So what you could do is as you double click in, I've just set up three of them, but you can now focus on the area of animation you want. And you can jump between these uh, bookmarks really quickly. So I just have jump one, jump two, jump three. You can go through, focus on the areas you want, jump out, see the full timeline really quickly. And it's really good for managing, uh, especially long animation scenes to break it down into manageable chunks. So what I would generally do is the second jump is probably the one that needs the most work at this moment. But instead of hand keying everything, let's go into dynamic motion to really help uh, make our lives a lot easier. And uh, so uh, again, with the radial menu, uh, all we need to do is go into dynamic motion. And what I've done here is just setting the contacts of the takeoffs and landings and using the COG as the center of gravity, we now have a physically accurate motion built for us. So it's still using our keys, but now it's giving us the correct path of what that would take for that time there. So it's really, really quick. Just with a couple of clicks, I've improved my, uh, my animation immensely. But if we also want to do creative changes here, we just have these planes and we can just drag them up if we want to make Electra jump higher throughout the shot. So really quickly, really interactively, you can now adjust her up, make her jumps a little bit higher, have a little bit more hang time, all while keeping the physically accurate motion. And so now, again, within a minute or so, we've improved our um, animation, we've been able to do creative changes really quickly. 
but sometimes uh, things throw us for a curve, and maybe we have a set change at the last minute. And we have a big block where we were jumping with Electra. Well, we still have uh, the ability to do this really easily with the dynamic motion, just by selecting these handles. And all I have to do is drag her up and everything maintains together. And now really quickly, now we have Electra jumping onto the block and we adjusted it within minutes. And we can just do it at the end. Let's just push Electra a little bit over to the, to the left. Um, and now we've re repositioned her as well, but all of our animation remains the same. So it's really quick, really fast, way faster than doing it by hand. But now I want to get that motion onto our character. And uh, what we have is a really, really quick uh, way of doing that and opening up our baking HUD. We just, uh, I'm, in this case, I'm just going to update my keys. And all that did was take my existing keys and move them to where uh, the new uh, position was from that new motion. So again, without doing that, it just gets done for us. And now we can jump in there and we can continue animating as needed with all those changes done in just a couple of minutes. And so here's just another example. And I'm just doing a little bit of blocking here, just electric kicking a ball around. And I just have the contact set for this. And as I go into uh, starting work on a lecture more, you can see I haven't touched the ball at all. So it's just going from those key contacts and just drifting between them. So again, you could go through and you can eyeball everything and try and guess the height that that ball needs to bounce. But why would we do that when we have dynamic motion? So let's go in there. And now doing the same thing, just setting the contacts of when it hits, we have physically accurate motion. And now we have that bouncing ball being kicked all around by Electra within just a few clicks. So again, once we have that motion, let's get that back onto the ball. And in this case, I'm just going to bring in my graph editor just so we could take a look here. And if you take a look at it, we'll take a look at the TY uh, curve. You can see here's my contact uh, points and the spliny little curve where it's all drifting. Let's get this, we'll open up our baking tool. And what we have here is we can bake uh, essential keys. So this is going to bake the fewest keys needed to get that curve and build my keys for me. So we go from a bad looking curve to a nice beautiful curve with keys all ready to go. We're ready to animate as, if needed. And so we've also had a lot of uh, improvements to our graph editor. So as we can see, now if we want to make a, one of the balls bounce higher on one of the kicks, we can easily grab it. And now using our middle mouse button, if we move it vertically first, it will move a uh, constraint in value. And if we move it uh, horizontal first, it will move it in uh, time. So really quick, you don't have to select the keys anymore. You can box select them and move it from anywhere on the graph. And now the other thing I love is our vertical adapt. And I can move now my keys outside of frame and it reframes for me. I can zoom in on it. I can pan all across and it'll always keep that curve uh, continuously in frame. So you can select other curves, you can select other controllers, it will just all keep it in there. So when you're doing your curve editing and cleanups with your keys, it's really, really quick to do. And another example of a uh, feature we've added is that sometimes you just want to uh, move keys on one curve, and it's kind of tricky to just to uh, pick them and not pick some of the other keys. So now what we have is if you just select the curve, hold down S, and now when you select uh, those keys, it will only select the keys on that curve. Again, really nice to not have to be so finicky. And for those people that like, uh, anim like uh, adjusting their curves with tangents, we have a new curve pick picking tool. So you can actually just drag on the curve and move it around. You can also use the tangents, or you could be like me, and I just usually use auto slope all the time. So lots of good features in there, uh, lots more coming as well, uh, but really good just to get everything uh, nice and fast and good quality of light features in there. And so here you go, um, we just have uh, We just have the ball that was going bouncing fine. So let's get into some ragdoll. And you can see here, White Electra, she doesn't have um, any animation really. She's just going up and down. You can see her hands actually intersecting with the, the wooden Electra's thigh. So let's go into ragdoll and see what we can do here. And I'm just going to offset them just so we can see what's going on. And as a as I play through this, you'll be able to see that the ragdoll uh, simulation that we've set up now the hand doesn't intersect. We got some motion on the legs and the head, and we're going to actually toss her into the chair. And now we get her flopping into the chair with all the chair reaction. 
So um, really quickly, we got some motion uh, from almost no motion. And now let's get those controls, uh, get that ragdoll onto our um, controls. And we could do this many ways. So I don't want to have everything baked all the time on every control. So now we can actually just set, select a set, in this case, the hands, the arms, and the head. And now by uh, recording the poses, I can quickly step through my keys and I've updated all my characters' poses on that set um, without needing to bake everything out. And we're good to go. So we, now we have sparse keys. I can really quickly animate anything from there. And we now no longer have uh, the hand intersection and we got some subtle movement going on. But of course, we want to do the toss and the throw into the chair. And in this case, I'm going to select more controls and I'm going to just add the chair as well, just so that they, you can do them separately, but I'm just going to do it to, uh, together so it's a little bit quicker. Again, we can go down, start recording poses. And this is the part I love is that sometimes you don't need the whole ragdoll thing. So you can just actually go through the same way, select the keys you want, and just pull those keys out. And you, then you could start animating as you want after. But in this case, we have lots of good motion of her hitting the chair. So you could just hold it down, drag it through, and now we're gonna be baking the, uh, those, uh, recording those keys onto our controls for every frame. And we'll just do it for the toss as well. And so really quickly, we've now just, um, as we, we can just leave uh, Ragdoll and go back into our animate. And it's now put all our controls on, our, all the Ragdoll sim onto our controls, but we've been able to tell it what controls to use, what characters to use, and when we want our keys. So it's really allowing the animator to have a little bit more flexibility rather than just bake out everything and then deal with all those uh, keys after. And as you can see, this is just uh, straight from uh, putting it out onto the character with the ragdoll. We now have the floppy Electra. But again, now we can go really quickly from there and we can just do a little bit of animation. And I've just changed a few things in here. And instead of flopping on here, now we have Electra sitting up in the chair at the end, really quick, using going from almost nothing to um, usable animation that you can now keep on editing is in a really fast way. Yeah. But now let me introduce Esther, who's going to talk about our new rigging engine, which lets us do all those cool things. And I think that just started, so oh, no. my fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. So now that we've seen all these great work from Warren in the viewport, this viewport-centric approach for animation, we're of course all curious to see what the magic behind this is and how we can actually drive this. And you might remember from KineFX when we introduced it that we put the skeleton into geometry, which gave us like the first start in working on a data-driven approach. And that, um, and we're now pushing it a huge leap further with H20, and we're converting everything that we need for an animation scene into geometry, profiting wildly from a more HDA independent approach and something that is purely data-driven. And the engine driving everything underneath is called Apex, and I'm gonna introduce it to you today. So now that we know that everything we wanna have is geometry, we can first of all think about what a character actually is. Usually we're gonna have a geometry and we want to deform it, and for that we usually use a skeleton in order to define certain points in space. How do we define the transformation of the skeleton? For that we need a rig logic, usually a graph, that defines where our controls are, what the inputs for the animator are, and so on and so forth. And now that we have all these data, we need to have a neat way of organizing it in geometry. And for that, we are introducing geometry-packed folders. So we all use folder structures and file structures in our everyday life, and we know how great they are, because we can add files, we can update files, we can search for file paths, we can filter them, and now we are profiting from that uh, by translating all of that into geometry directly into SOPs. And when we now look at our SOP picture, we can see how nice and neat it is. We can just add that rig geometry and add it nice and neatly in order to have that organized structure there as a result. So that's nice and good for a character, but when we now actually think about an animation scene, there's lots more to come. So of course we want to have one or more characters, of course, and we're gonna have a whole bunch of more data that we now need to store. The most important one to point out here is animation. 
So we all, of course, know that in SOPs you can create awesome curves in SOPs. And we are now transferring that principle that we can store curves as geometry over to our animation channels, and we simply store these 2D curves as geometry as well, and we are calling them channel pack primitives. But we're not stopping there. Of course, in the viewport, you want to also interactively change what your geometry is. So you might actually create other ad hoc uh, elements such as constraints or locators. When we now look at our scene, it's still neatly and nicely organized in geometry. And because it's geometry and we can modify geometry in various ways, we can of course modify it in SOPs, but we have also Python to our disposal. When what can we do with Python? We can drive the viewport with it. So when we look at our actual SOP picture, we can see that there's actually one important note that we need for the animator, and this is where Warren lives, so to say. So he uses the scene animate node. We can, of course, have a few utility elements in order to add our characters beforehand together to, in order to assemble our scene, but everything that we are doing in the viewport, AK manipulating our animation curves, creating these tools and all of that stuff as in animation tools like constraints, this all happens in the animation node. And then, just at the very end, we have the red node, and that's our scene invoke node. That's just the point when we actually introduce time dependency in our scene, and where we're gonna have time dependency, keeping our scene very lightweight. So now, we wanna, of course, see how that actually interactively is changing. And we can see changes. So, that's what I meant. We can actually manipulate that scene geometry right away in the viewport as we are going forward. So you can see I create constraints. These constraints are getting instantly added to our scene geometry as we are moving forward. That's the interactive level that we are talking about. And the same goes, of course, also for locators that we are creating. So now we're, of course, wondering about the engine driving everything underneath, and we're calling it Apex. Apex is our new all-purpose execution graph. In H20, it's gonna be primarily there for rigging. So why do we have it and what can we do with it? As you might have already guessed, um, Apex is a graph system that can be entirely stored as geometry. And that is of course great because now we have the procedural power of geometry all to our disposal. But it also means something else. When we are storing the graph, we're really just storing the graph. We're not actually evaluating it. And that concept is called delayed evaluation. And that means that we can evaluate what we need, when we need it, for maximum performance, and this is essential when we think about animation. And that pretty much brings me to my next point. Of course, everything is very fast and lightweight and not operator-bound, because we have just geometry. We can manipulate it via the viewport or maybe also via SOPs, but there's not one dedicated HDA that we can just use in order to work with it. Um, furthermore, the graph is dynamic and adaptive. That means we can change the graph and its behavior at any given point. And that point could be in SOPs, that point could be again in the viewport. And iterating again on performance, because animators love performance, we all love performance. So the graph is being compiled on the fly in order to emphasize that. So we can see that we're introducing a system that is specifically tailored for live real-time proceduralism and the uh, Apex just loves the viewport. And so now let's see what it actually looks in action. So here we are in the scene animate node. We have a bit of a test animation and we see the actual result of the graph working in the viewport. That's the rig driving it. And we can see in the viewport directly that we apparently have geometry representing our nodes. So now when I now go to my graph UI, and I change just the position or the color, we can see that the geometry reacts interactively directly. And now, just for fun, I'm gonna change my rig, cause I decided Electra is now supposed to become a Taurus lady. And now I have all of the subverbs to my disposal in combination with a whole bunch of numerical and custom type operations, cause let's think about rigs, it's a lot of matrix operations, and in the end, we, uh, we deform geometry. So I can combine all of that in the graph. Now we go back to our rig and we can see it instantly updates. I have a completely different result just by a few node changes. And just at that step here, we see, first of all, now output. Now I'm fetching specifically Electra as an output. And now I have actually Electra's output finally at my disposal, just at the last node, the, scene de uh, the time dependency that I was mentioning. And I also mentioned the dynamic behavior of it. And here we can see, I'm creating locators in the viewport and live as I'm doing this, 
is the rig changing that we're using for that. So that rig is modified with every locator that I'm, in this case, removing or adding. And you can see the growth on the modification of that, of that rig. And just think about the pure power of what you can do when you can change any rig, any tool that you give your animator on the fly based on the demands and what they want to do at that moment. This is incredibly powerful. But we don't just want to set this up in the UI or we have Python. We also want to have a nice rigging framework in order to make our lives easier setting these characters up. And for that, we are introducing a, a component-based rig framework that is designed to operate with fairly generic and customizable um, functions that operate on the whole character. And we use SOP as our interface. So you can see at any points when I make changes to my, in this case, my rig, I can see the changes directly, I can configure it with parameter, and I can gradually add functionality step by step as I'm going through and build up my rig. I can also see these changes directly in the viewport as I'm stepping further. And also a really important point is we're using SOP here as an interface. The actual functionality behind it is again a graph. What is great about graphs, we can in the future also again use them for viewport interaction. And here, for example, we're seeing one of these configurations. We saw how we switched mirroring on or off. And of course, we can also work with metadata. We use these metadata like properties and tags, and we use them, for example, for configuring our control shapes. So this is all nice and good, but usually what you want to do is you want to transfer your rigs over to a whole bunch of characters. In this case, I have two rigs, and they are very different. They have complete different orientations, different joint count, and different names. And we can see we already set up Electra. She's working nice. We have a very simple rig. Look at the node count up there in the graph UI. And we can see our test animation. It works great. Now we have that other character, different naming. What we have to our disposal is the use of tags and filtering by tags and properties in order to facilitate that transfer. And we can just see, even with the different names and orientations, our rig is apparently set up exactly in the same way. And we have a very different node count. But our animation looks pretty broken because we have such different orientations. So what can we do? We introduce retargeting. And not really even to introducing, you're all familiar with that from Kinefix. And that brings me right back to that. Um, so here I have now a scene where I want to push it a bit further. I could now animate that scene right away, animate Electra. But to be honest, I actually don't really want to hand animate her. So what am I doing? I can grab her skeleton and I can convert the controls of the rig to an actual skeleton. And with this, I can now do what I want. I have a mocap clip here. And what I'm doing with normal Kinefx style is I'm simply retargeting my information over to my control skeleton that I just extracted from Apex. And now I can simply update my scene with, those, uh, with this skeleton information. And you can see this is wonderful. I could output that right away and be happy. But I actually don't really want to stop there. I convert now these data to a motion clip. And that motion clip, again, can be converted to channel primitives, aka our animation curves. That means that I'm now back with the controls to my rig, but I have dense key data. Not ideal to work with. So what we can do here is we can simply use the new sliders in order to reduce the sampling to a more convenient way of continuing working on top of this, back with my two characters in the scene. Talking about two characters, I still have my wonderful chicken with an animation. So the, it's a bit sad that the chicken isn't flying, so I'm grabbing its root control. And now I want to attach that root control, ideally to a curve that I can art direct. So I'm creating myself a normal swap curve. And I now set myself a little bob setup. And now we're pretty much doing the same. And you can see our joint is already nicely following along. Same step again, I'm converting it to a motion clip. Now I'm grabbing my existing animation from a chicken, that's the pink node. I'm updating it, and now I have a wonderful flying chicken. And what this shows is, and this is very essential, is Apex and Kinefax work as a team together. You don't need to think about it as an either or, it's an end. And that is very important to point out. And now, of course, we've seen Electra a lot in this demonstration. And Electra is a very great starting point because it's a very simple rig to look at. And it's also very simple when you want to get familiar with the animation. And Electra is going to be available as a test geometry uh, directly in Houdini. But we are not stopping there. We want you guys to have fun when you explore this. So we provide for you 
luchador, uh, the luchador and the chicken to play with. And they're going to be available in the content library. And we're not just putting the animation files out there. There's actually like the scene files are in there as well. So you can explore rigging and animation in one go when you have a look at it. So, and what you can see here is, let's see the chicken in action. Um, the chicken rig is, of course, a lot more complex, and you might find more things like IKFK switches there again that you are familiar with. I just want to point out we are not against IKFK switches. You can use them, but it's a lot nicer when you don't constantly have to rely on them, and that's what we want to emphasize. And we are also using here techniques such as joint blend shapes for the face, which is really powerful and very fast. So you can see we are already capable of setting up joint, uh, joint setups as well. And another po important point to point out is these rigs are also completely set up with the new um, component rigging workflow that I just mentioned. So you can pretty much completely already build on top of that. And you can see that the structure we are building there is scaling up very nicely even to more complex rigs like these ones. So um, we, of course, also want to see them in action. And those characters have been, by the way, provided by Odd Studios. And now let's enjoy two wonderful fight scenes of the chicken and the lojada. Oui. Yeah. And one more time, because it's so beautiful. <laughs> and last but not least, <laughs> enjoy this. <laughs> and having said that, um, we are of course still in beta, but these characters are waiting for you. They're waiting to be explored. Enjoy it, have fun with it, explore the power of Apex, and with this, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Scott, who's going to talk about muscles. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Esther. So yeah, as it was mentioned earlier, muscles are now out of beta, so that's Great, but that doesn't mean we just stop developing things on muscles. We're still adding features. So let's take a look at some of those. So you've probably seen over the years us mention something called a Franken muscle, uh, both as something in development and actually a quite old tool with a similar concept. But a Franken muscle is basically a collection of muscles that normally are independent, but all brought together into a single mesh. And you can kind of see here the colors indicating where muscles exist within this one tet mesh. Um, but they are segmented. They actually are individual muscles uh, sort of just represented as a single tet mesh. And there's a lot of benefits to being able to, to do that. So obviously, you can still paint things, say which muscle is which. We have a lot of tools for painting IDs. So you can still say this section of this sort of blob of tets is a very specific muscle. Um, so why would you want to do this? Well, there's, there's actually a lot of reasons. One is just workflow. If you've ever had to model a full creature's muscles, um, it's actually very difficult. It's time consuming. Changes are difficult. Um, and on top of that, you have to worry about things intersecting with each other. And that causes problems down the road when you're simulating. So, so you get rid of that sort of part of the pipeline and make it a lot simpler. It becomes almost a sculpting exercise where you pick groups of muscles and sculpt them rather than build individual muscles. Although you can see here in this example that you don't have to necessarily do that for every group. So instead you create these groups of muscles, but where you want sliding or overlapping action, you can still create multiple uh, Franken muscles. But like I said, they are individual. You can see we can trigger them and flex them still as if they were individual muscles. Um, which is really awesome because apart from the fact that, again, you have this less complex scene to deal with, um, you also start to remove issues from the solving as well because muscles that are next to each other don't have to worry about collisions and things like that necessarily anymore. Um, and oftentimes, even in the real world, muscles that are in these groups do work sort of together. They don't necessarily always work individually. So this is sort of a simplification of the underlying process. Um, but you can see here in this animation, I promise it does animate. Here we go. In this animation, maybe not, uh, of the, uh, this character walking. I'm going to try one more time. Hey, there we go. Um, of these muscles flexing and working together. And as you can see, there's still a ton of detail. 
Um, there's still a lot of information there. You can still see the flexing, even muscles sliding over each other in certain areas. So you haven't really lost very much, but you've gained a huge amount in terms of workflow and potentially the complexity of the simulation itself. Um, and then of course, eventually you do want to uh, wrap um, skin around our muscles. One more time. Hey, there we go. Uh, wrap skin around uh, the muscles so you get that feeling of sliding and so on. And you can see here that one of the nice things is because you're really, once you start adding skin and eventually fur and things, you know, seeing an individual muscle is not that important. It's more about the overall motion and this sort of flexing and sliding action. Um, another sort of side benefit is that in this case, we went straight to a skin simulation that wraps those muscles, um, whereas sometimes you would want to create a tissue simulation first, which kind of creates a uniform uh, casing around everything, uh, and then a skin on top of that. But because the underlying tet mesh is simplified in this case, uh, there's less issues to worry about. There are less crevices, places for the mesh to get caught. Um, so Franken muscles just gives you this extra workflow, especially when maybe you have a lot of characters to do. And again, modeling every individual muscle is time consuming and a lot of artist work. Um, so here's a Franken muscle setup uh, that one of our, one of our developers uh, made, uh, which are just a full sim uh, with gravity and so on of the Franken muscles inside this uh, tri dude uh, <laughs> flexing and twitching and moving around. We've kind of discovered we thought he would walk around on his feet, but apparently they slide around uh, on their back like that. Um, so some of you may have seen this um, example um, in other places. This is an example from our friends over at Epic Games. Um, and they used our uh, muscle tools to train a, uh, an AI, essentially, to deform the skin based on the muscles that are underneath it. And the approach they took was to run a bunch of vellum simulations, use that to train the AI, and then use that model, of course, to do this real-time skin deformation to pretty nice effect, I think, really, really good. And that was very... Um, inspiring to us. So we went back to a character that you maybe saw in the last launch, which is uh, our capybara here. Uh, and this animation is just um, a traditional sort of muscle setup. There's no ML here. Um, there are muscles, tissue, obviously fur, and so on. Um, so we wanted to use this and see, well, what can we do with ML? So to start going down that path, uh, we looked at the Onyx inference engine which is built into Houdini 20, by the way. Um, so you can actually use this if you're interested in trying uh, working on machine learning projects on your own. Um, and it's kind of the basis for this test. So we started out with the idea of like, well, can we take a piece of the pipeline and sort of drive that using machine learning? So we decided to go with blend skinning, you know, a common sort of character issue. So on the left, uh, you can see linear blend skinning. Uh, and that's just you know, the typical sort of way characters are deformed, where you paint weights to you know, say this bone drives this part of the skin and so on. Um, on the far right, there is a vellum simulation. This is a tissue simulation. So we posed the capybara and ran a sim to see how would the tissue react in that pose. Um, and then here in the center is the ML skinning. Um, and so this is after we did a bunch of training, we said, hey, how should this mesh look in this pose? And you can see if you compare the middle um, to the right, um, there, it's a very close match. So our training and our result is, is very close, which is good. Um, and if you compare it to the left, the linear blend skinning, you can see that we're actually getting some nice benefits. We're getting uh, things like the shoulders kind of bunching up in a way that's difficult to do in the traditional uh, blend skinning approach. Um, so again, let's just sort of break down what, what, what do we do? How do we actually accomplish this? Um, so much like I mentioned before, we start with a vellum simulation. And again, this is a tissue simulation. We've basically are running a standard sort of simplified setup. Then we use PDG to distribute that because we want to train as many poses as we can. So we run a quasi-static vellum sim on essentially thousands of random poses. We take the rig, we pose it, we run the sim to see like, hey, how, how should the tissue look? Um, in these poses. Then we use PyTorch to actually train the AI to actually do the, the, the real training, the work here. 
Um, and then Onyx inference engine creates the model, and then we can run our new uh, ML skinning. Um, this is kind of just like an overview of the, the basic approach that I just kind of walked through. Um, but the key thing here is that we're computing the weights using ML. So um, the deformation is basically, or the, sorry, the machine learning, the AI is, is calculating how the weights should exist on that mesh. And then we're doing pretty much a standard deform at the end of the day. So let's see how it looks on the character. So on the left is the standard uh, linear blend skating approach, uh, which is you know, not modified for just for this example. It's how we actually did animate the capybara in previous releases. Um, and on the right is the ML skinning result. And you can see right away, you start to get some interesting things with this idea, which is that uh, on the left, you know, the bones in the head and the neck drive just specific parts of the mesh. Whereas on the right, it kind of has a more holistic view of the mesh. So as the head tilts up, uh, as you would expect, some of the flesh that isn't even near the head starts to move, right? Um, and not only that, because it is a vellum sim, a tissue sim, you can see the neck sort of bulges out as the head tilts down as well. Um, and so this happens sort of on the rig. So we're starting to get some really nice um, results from that. So let's take a look at a sort of rigged version of this so you can see um, how it looks uh, on an actual rig. So this actually is a Kinefex rig. It's kind of the old approach. It's not using Apex in this example. Um, but you can see here some, some nice things starting to happen because problematic areas of a rig are often like where joints come together, right? So elbows, knees, that kind of a thing. Especially cases like this where the leg is raised and the thigh sort of connects with the stomach. Um, you can see here that as the leg is lifted up, because that pose was in the training data, the stomach is sort of lifted up as well. And typically, this would be um, fixed using post space deformation or just post fixes to, to clean up the mesh. But we're sort of getting that for free, in a sense, uh, with this ML example. Um, and uh, here, apologies. Maybe, there we go. <laughs> uh, we're switching back and forth between the ML skinning and the linear blend skinning. Um, and you can see the result is much nicer in the machine learning version. Um, and just in case you're thinking like, well, we just modified this to make the linear blend skinning look as bad as possible. Um, this actually is how Capybara was painted and weighted um, in the previous animation you've seen. It's just this type of pose is problematic for that style of uh, skinning. Uh, and then, of course, we wanted to see, like, let's, let's just compare it to, like, a sequence. So this is a, an old uh, uh, sort of wrestling animation that uh, Warren actually um, did. And so we wanted to compare them next to each other. And, of course, here things are maybe a bit more subtle. Maybe it's a little harder to see exactly where things are working or aren't working. Um, but if you look closely, again, especially around joints or where limbs come together, you're starting to get some really nice effects that, again, possible using you know, multiple stages, lots of artists tweaking to get things to work, where in this case, um, the AI is handling that for us and giving us um, some really nice um, skin motion. Um, so now here's an example where we thought, well, like, okay, well, we have, we're running simulations. What if we dramatically change <laughs> the input? Uh, so in this case, we've sort of uh, inflated Cappy on the right, and on the left, we sort of sucked the air uh, out of the capybara. Now, do you want to do this? Who knows? <laughs> uh, but it was more of an experiment to see, you know, what if we really dramatically changed this thing? You know, how would the skinning react? And in some of this, it actually reacts quite well. Keep in mind, this is R&D. We're just trying interesting things. But you can see, even with this <laughs> massive uh, change in, in, in the overall shape, um, we're still getting actually reasonable results without somebody going in and repainting the weights and so on. So it's starting to open up really interesting possibilities for the whole workflow of uh, skinning a character. Um, and so like was mentioned before, this is also going to be on the content library. So just to be clear, in case you're not sure, this ML skinning tool is not in Houdini 20. It's not a tool that you just drop down and suddenly you have this. Um, this is a, a framework. This is an experiment. Um, but we want to give you this setup, give you everything we did so that you can run this yourself. Um, because as Kristen mentioned, what we're finding is that 
you get better results when you train for a specific outcome, right? Like you have a character, you want to train for your character, not a general case. Um, and you can see here why that might be. It would be hard to train uh, a model on every possible type of shaped character that would be. But if you factor in, you know, pose deform uh, post space deformation fixes, post fixes, the balance of, you know, simulating 150 hours of poses versus 150 hours of artist time tweaking everything, things start to balance out. Um, and then, of course, in the future, you can continue to add poses as necessary to the training data to fix things that artists are finding as they go. Um, but if you want to just start with something that is sort of pre-made, something that you don't have to <laughs> work with uh, from scratch, our, our friends at Bismuth and Intagma have been working on some uh, ML operators uh, for a little while now. And they have tutorials, they have tools, so you can actually kind of dive in and start working with maybe some more familiar tools like stable diffusion and, and so on. Um, and so before we go on, I'm going to introduce uh, Rob Stoffer back up onto stage to introduce the, the next section of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we're about a quarter of the way through. Uh, so we have lots more stuff to go through. Um, it's great stuff we've seen so far. The character stuff is really exciting. Um, as everyone's mentioned, a lot of this stuff is on the content library, so please, please get in there and play around with it. Um, it's, it is still in beta, um, but it, it's, all those rigs are going to be available for you, so get in there and start animating. Um, so moving on uh, into more familiar territory, uh, we always are dedicated to effects, and we always will be. We always want to innovate in that space, and we'll continue um, to do so. Uh, so with that, we have lots of fun things with clouds, um, some new uh, changes to some of the ocean tools, um, as well as we've rounded out things with crowds and crowds and SOPs. Uh, so now a lot of stuff is available in SOPs. We've completed that circle of dynamic tools and SOPs. Um, so with that, I'm gonna bring Scott back up and uh, he's gonna take us through to the end. <clears throat> Um, okay, thank you, thank you, Rob. Let's let's go ahead and dig into this a bit. Um, so, uh, for Houdini 20, we've made some advancements on our flip solver. You can see some new attributes we're calculating and exporting, which are just nice when it comes to shading or even driving other effects off the results of a flip simulation. Um, but the key thing here, just to point out, is that um, up until now, we've had pretty much all of the flip solver available in SOPs, and now we've sort of, again, closed that circle, as Rob said, and added whitewater into a SOP-level tool set. And the reason we're doing this is basically to put artists um, to work on setups in a familiar environment. Most artists who use Houdini are familiar with SOPs, maybe more than DOPs. So having everything at that level um, is really nice and lets you sort of work very efficiently. Um, so having the whitewater tool available there um, is a really nice addition to that tool set. And it lets you sort of create um, scenes like this one. Uh, yeah, I like to say this is uh, an elephant and the natural predator of the elephant, the humpback whale, all together uh, on a beach as they appear in nature. This is a clip from National Geographic. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you can see that it works, it works well. You can get incredible, incredible results. Um, so speaking of white water, there's, there's obviously bubbles in white water. If I can get the animation to play. Here we go. So um, a common problem with bubbles, especially if you're talking about close up like this, where you're seeing bubbles close up, is you know, what do the bubbles do when they interact with each other, when they touch each other? And uh, in real life, you know, they have this sort of, they're joined, but they're not quite joined. They create these interesting shapes. So we've created this tool that basically takes particles with a radius and generates um, spheres or bubbles and solves those intersections. So you can get this ability to show this close-up um, view of these bubbles and not have the odd sort of intersections that you sometimes will get when you try and do that. Um, interestingly, these were actually made for the cloud tools, but we immediately found like, oh, this is actually more of a bubble tool than it is a cloud tool. Um, and let's look at the Ripple Solver. So um, in the last release, we had a, uh, 
a shallow water solver, a ripple kind of solver, which was more of a fluid solver. It was an actual fluid sim using height fields. Um, whereas now this is the new ripple solver um, that acts on geometry. And so you might wonder like, well, why? <laughs> why have a solver that does ripples and then a separate kind of ripple solver? Um, and the key here is that this works on geometry rather than height fields. And that it's not actually a fluid simulation in a sense, it's a spring-based simulation. And that might seem like, well, again, why would we do that? And the reason is that gives us a lot more freedom to put ripples on other kinds of things. So here we have the, the capybara, and it's dynamically moving, it's animated moving geometry, and we're able to animate these ripples, uh, solve these ripples across the character um, when this sort of shock wave hits, which really wouldn't be possible with the older tool. So suddenly we've opened up a lot of possibilities. Um, and this was written in OpenCL as well. So it's very, very fast to calculate on, even on dense meshes. So this opens up a lot of possibilities for, you know, typical effectsy setups like this, and then even sort of motion graphicsy effects and so on. So again, we're filling out all those gaps. You know, we have a fluid solver kind of ripple solver setup, and now we have this OpenCL fast geometry based um, solver as well. Um, and speaking of OpenCL, for those of you who are maybe a little more technical, who dive into writing code and OpenCL, um, here is our new OpenCL snippets. So this is sort of a, a new way of writing OpenCL code, which can be pretty cumbersome um, up until this point. And this basically takes it and puts it into snippets. You can see the code there on the right. And let's it um, lets you write code in a more comfortable way, a bit closer to writing Vex, essentially, where you have this kind of built-in functions that help you get further along without having to know as much about how OpenCL works under the hood. Um, and of course, the benefit is that you have this very interactive tool now with this fluid sim being guided uh, by these uh, curves, essentially. Um, and the nice thing is you could actually go and edit that code on the right and have it immediately affect everything on the left. So it becomes this interactive sort of toolkit uh, for writing OpenCL, which I think people are really going to are really going to gravitate toward. Continuing along, so this is just a common problem. It's sort of a physically plausible solution to the problem of wind hitting an object, moving things, and then on the shadowed side, on the other side of the object, you should get less wind or possibly no wind. Um, so people had lots of ways, the custom setups for doing this, and now we sort of built it into the Vellum Solver to allow you to have um, wind occlusion. And it just gives you sort of a more believable overall effect. Um, the nice thing is that this tool also has self-shadowing. So uh, if you have sort of multiple layers of clothes and things like that, you know, the layers will occlude each other as well. So you start to get more and more believable results um, in situations where wind is playing a key factor. Now you can see as this sort of furry character moves the book in front of itself and the piece of paper, how the sim changes. And again, there's lots of ways of modifying this behavior to have a softer fall off around the object or maybe still even have some wind in the shadowed areas, even if that's maybe not the most realistic. So again, very arc directable, very customizable, pushing us toward a more plausible physical simulation. Um, we've also increased uh, add some new features to RBD material fracture. So we had some presets for things like glass and so on. Um, and in this case, we added an extra feature for um, curved surfaces, curved glass surfaces, which obviously um, break up differently than uh, panes of glass. Uh, again, essentially a preset in the material type uh, for flat panes or curved glass. So just helping the artist get a little further along with, again, having to deal with building their old tool set to try and solve this fairly common problem. Um, we've also moved RBD cone twist constraints into SOPs. Um, so it exists at the DOP level and also the SOP level, um, which is really nice. And we've also improved the handle. This is sort of a complex constraint with lots of different sort of overlapping things. So having this new handle that's very interactive in the viewport with better visualization helps you get that set up um, a lot faster. And then having it at that SOP level, again, going back to the point of bringing things up to that level to make things a little more artist friendly for these kinds of setups, that's just a piece of that puzzle. And so a solution that might come from that is something like a car rig, where you, you want to have, um, you know, essentially mimicking a, the suspension of a, uh, of a car. So 
here's a, a car rig that we've sort of uh, built to, to enable people to sort of jump in and start using this. Again, an extremely common setup. Um, and we've even set it up such that uh, you can uh, sort of interactively drive this rig. So this is a sort of a live simulation uh, of this car actually being driven around by an artist uh, with one of the gaming steering wheels sort of driving this car around. So if you're thinking about previs and things like that, this opens up a lot of interesting possibilities of actually driving a car around and, and seeing the results uh, immediately. Um, and like a lot of our other uh, options today, other parts of the presentation, this will be available on the content library for you to try out. Um, not immediately at launch, but pretty soon afterwards. You'll be able to download this, try out the rig, maybe drive it around your own uh, terrain. Um, so earlier you did see uh, Warren talking about these uh, dynamic motion paths or ballistic paths. Um, this is, of course, a Houdini sort of approach of saying like, well, we want to make this tool available for other things, right? It's not just for one thing. Um, that's sort of the beauty of Houdini. So here we have this dynamic path or ballistic path. I'm driving the arc of this arrow to give us a nice realistic approach. And then much like what Warren showed, being able to retarget it quite easily. Um, uh, and that gets nicely combined with sticky collisions. Sticky collisions are a extremely common effects setup where you want something to hit a dynamic character and then stick to it. Uh, of course, not just characters, could be just about anything. Um, so here we've basically added that option now. We've built a solution so uh, to really get you over that hump because it's actually quite a complex um, problem. Um, and it is built into uh, the crowd solver. So that means we can find when those collisions occur, when the things are actually stuck into the characters and then modify the agent, to, in this case, either going to a ragdoll or switching animation and switching into a partial ragdoll. So you have a lot of options, especially for um, triggering these things dynamically, because obviously if you have a large crowd of agents, maybe tens of thousands, you don't want to worry about you know, hand keying on and off reactions to things that are dynamic. So all of the system sort of works together to give you um, a nice tool set for dealing with um, large scale crowds. Um, so earlier it was mentioned that we're moving crowds into SOPs uh, as well. So here's an example of the crowd motion path evaluate. Um, so what you're looking at here is basically these paths are where we sort of predict the character is going to move based on the animation input. Um, but they're not sort of static things. You can actually put collisions in the way um, and we'll deform this path, this animation to have the characters move around the collisions, and that actually works for self-collisions as well, or collisions between agents, I should say. So they'll avoid objects in your scene, but they'll also avoid each other. Um, but you know, since we have these paths, we also made it directly editable. So you can easily jump in and change the agent's paths, have them you know, go in specific directions, and suddenly you know, you're able to use crowd tools, but maybe even in a very much more hand-authored uh, vision. Maybe this is more for a hero shot where you have very specific needs for that crowd. It must move at this speed, you know, in this direction. Uh, and so having this hands-on approach in softs uh, really opens up a lot of possibilities uh, with crowds. And there are a lot more tools than we're showing here tonight. Um, here's a side effects lab tool. So this is a new tool uh, that works with sort of looping animations. Um, in this case, we're blending, uh, obviously, density, color, velocity all together, and then looping it so that you can create these kind of dynamic, um, Instagrammable uh, uh, effects, um, uh, just making really cool stuff. Obviously, also useful for generating sprites for games and things like that. So a lot of use cases here for this tool um, available via Side Effects Labs. Um, so here we have this um, evolving... Um, cloud simulation. You can see it rises up as you imagine a time lapse of a cloud would um, and then cools off and sort of falls back down and kind of evaporates essentially. So this is uh, maybe to your surprise not actually using any of the cloud tools. This is just a simulation. Um, uh, although it absolutely could use the cloud tools as a source for this um, or you could use this as the starting point of modeling clouds. Maybe you would grab a frame and say that's a cloud. But uh, 
as cool as that is and as beautiful as that is, it's cumbersome to work that way, right? You're running a simulation kind of hoping you're getting the shapes that you want and then maybe grabbing frames out. So uh, the approach we took um, for Houdini 20 is to provide essentially modeling tools for clouds. So let's just take a look at a simple sort of workflow demo here. We're starting with cloud shape generate. Um, you can see it has some cloud species for different typical kinds of clouds. Um, and this is just creating shapes, base shapes for you to start with for modeling your clouds. Um, obviously you could model them by hand, but this gives you a nice procedural way to start. Uh, and maybe if you wanted to do lots and lots of variations, you could automate this process. Uh, we're following that up with this utility where we basically find the intersections between these spheres um, and create lines in them and then scatter points onto those lines, um, which is actually a useful utility even outside of clouds. Um, and of course, clouds are volumes, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, make a volume out of it. And now we have this new cloud clip tool, which allows you to clip a volume. Um, but again, with clouds in mind, so you can distort uh, the bottom and get that nice flat bottom that you kind of expect from a lot of cloud types. And then ending with cloud billowy noise, which um, are sort of a bunch of noises customized specifically to give you cloud-like appearances. So you can do things like invect the noise or add layers and layers of noise using iterations. Um, and then we have some overrides for the look of the clouds in the viewport, depending on the kind of cloud you're making. It just helps bring out the detail or suppress that detail. Um, there are a lot of these tools. Uh, this is uh, just an example of the billowy uh, cloud noise. Um, this is a viewport render, by the way. Um, and it really lets you create highly detailed clouds really, really quickly. Um, and uh, gives you a whole tool set around it. So we don't have time to go through all of the tools, but there's also a wispy cloud noise as well, which allows you to create these more fluffy, puffy clouds. So this has the same input um, as the previous one, but um, with the wispy cloud noise, which again gives you that nice uh, cotton ball <laughs> sort of effect. And where things get um, interesting is when you start combining these, because essentially these are modeling operations. You're modeling these clouds. So here we're combining the billowy cloud noise and the wispy cloud noise and the flattening to give you this variety of clouds that have this sort of interesting sort of windswept parts and then other parts that seem more stable, um, which is really important because clouds actually do come in a lot of different varieties and they often feature this kind of mix of almost um, torn apart look versus sort of cohesive look. Uh, and here's just a, a very high resolution shot of a cloud, just again to show you the amount of detail you are able to get out of this tool set. And while again, you could run a simulation and kind of hope you get a shape like this, in this case you're able to almost directly model exactly what you need for your shot. Um, but sometimes you actually want you know, a huge amount of clouds, a, a sky full of clouds. So we have, uh, in this case this is the skybox tool which very similar to the billowy noise uses a bunch of noises to create a large field of clouds. So this is for more when you don't necessarily want hero clouds, you just need lots and lots of clouds to fill the entire uh, background. Um, and there are a lot of presets uh, for real cloud types. I'm gonna definitely forget all the names, but <laughs> they're cirrus clouds, nimbus clouds, um, on and on. So here's a bunch of the presets for different cloud scapes that you can create you know, the, the serratus clouds, these sort of rib-like crowds, uh, clouds, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, but you can see lots of different variations you can get for that large scale um, cloud setups. Um, uh, and we've also worked real hard on the noises here so that when you animate the noises, you get sort of a rolling cloud effect um, as opposed to just the feeling of noise just moving through a volume. So you can see that um, it actually does seem to sort of maintain shape somewhat and roll the way you would expect clouds to as you saw in that pyro simulation. Um, now here's an example of a render combining those. So we have hero clouds and the sky field um, brought together. Um, and the look here is actually interesting. It's, be, it's using an occlusion based shader. So rendering clouds is very difficult. Um, they have lots of light scattering all over them. Uh, they're time consuming to render if you want to get that almost powdery look that clouds can have. And so we've included some utilities to bake um, an ambient occlusion pass and use that in the shader to render clouds extremely fast. Um, so you can get a look that maybe isn't as realistic as it could be, but is much faster. 
And that works in partnership with uh, some updates to our volume shaders to allow you to uh, get this powdery look um, without having to pay the full cost of scattering potentially hundreds of times. Um, but as I said, at the end of the day, this is geometry uh, being turned into volume. So we have some different tools for, for creating these clouds. This is just another utility of cloud shape from line where you just input a line and it does a similar sort of scattering effect that you saw before. Um, it's very interactive and live. So this maybe is for more abstract things or if you have very specific places clouds need to go and you wanna just input a bunch of curves, um, you can do that. Um, but of course you can also do any shape. You, know, you can input uh, any kind of geometry into the system because um, Houdini is already very adept at dealing with uh, volumetric data. So you can still use tools that have nothing to do with clouds. Things like uh, volume deform, for instance, to add a twirling propeller to this uh, plane cloud. Um, so, um, you know, like a lot of our tools, you have the, yes, we built a bunch of specific cloud tools, but because it's Houdini, you can combine them with any of our volumetric tools to create interesting effects. Um, okay, so let's get to Solaris uh, and Karma. So it was already mentioned that Karma XPU um, is now uh, gold. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, here's a render you may have seen uh, in some previous presentations, just this sort of whiskey glass. Um, but the reason we're showing it is to just show that we've sort of um, reached feature parity in a way with Karma CPU. I mean, there are things that one does that the other doesn't, but here you can see dispersion, nested dielectrics, absorption, so things that have been missing from XB now, all available to help you render these sort of complex scenes with multiple different types of transparencies and rays sort of shifting color over uh, depth. So all of that is now available to you in Karma XPU. And so we're really confident now you can Use, uh, use Karma XPU to create scenes like that. Uh, motion graphics advertise to get really realistic results in short times. Okay, so let's move on to some maybe lower level things. Um, so here is a new uh, Material X uh, node that will be available, we're calling it Room Map. And just to give you a little description of what's happening here. Uh, on the left, the sort of animated thing that you see is a single quad, there is no dimensionality to that, it's a flat, quad. Um, and it's using the room map to take the texture map on the right and turn it into this sort of fake three-dimensional space on the left. Um, and what's really valuable about this is that it's just a texture map. So if you just wanted to take photographs of the interior of a space, you could easily do that. You could use some sort of image editing software to lay it out this way, and you would get a nice result without having to do a lot of work. Um, we also have the ability to add slices to this. So the corners of this mesh um, allow you to create things in depth to give a better sense of depth in this um, interior space, the room map. Um, and again, could all be hand painted as this was. Um, but of course, we're in Houdini and we wanna give you some other tools to deal with this. So you can also bake these things from actual geometry. So in this case, we modeled a room uh, with furniture and so on. Um, lighting, and because it's all together uh, when we bake it, you get a really nice cohesive look where the light from the ceiling lights the things on the floor, including the slices. Um, and even you can see one of the slices has a lamp in it and that lamp is casting light into the room. So it takes the concept and then gives you the ability to have this very cohesive result where it really feels like those things are all together in 3D space, even though in reality they're sort of two-dimensional slices. Um, and of course, 
why not make it a procedural setup? So uh, using PDG, we generated 25 of these maps using sort of a slot machine style approach where we swap in and out different lighting scenarios, different geometry, different texture apps uh, to create a variety of these rooms. So you can easily pump out you know, a city's worth of these room shaders or room maps. Um, of course, with the ultimate goal of putting them on something like a building, right? So buildings are complicated. They have hundreds, possibly thousands of rooms in them. And so creating geometric detail for all that is obviously very costly. You could instance them, but it is costly. Um, but using the room map, suddenly you're able to give the impression of complexity without paying the cost of that complexity. Um, and it even works you know, closer up. They're still very plausible um, at sort of medium distances, um, which, is, which is really nice. So you actually can get pretty close to the buildings. Um, we have a utility for defining these room maps, which is to say which room goes on which surface. Um, and it even has the ability to put it on curved things. So you can have a curved glass like you can see in the top sort of middle or even some of the other examples. Tilted glass, all of those things are possible. There are limitations, of course, um, since this is at the end of the day an illusion, um, but it's still um, a valuable tool. And of course, if you were imagine generating an entire city's worth of these buildings, suddenly you know, you'll be very happy to have this kind of an optimization, uh, but still giving a really nice result. Um, and then just as a nice side note, if you do take the baking approach where you actually generate a room and bake the texture map from it, if you ever did need to get very close to a building or if you ever did need to be you know, seeing it uh, under specific lighting conditions, well, you have that geometry. You actually could instance it into that part of your scene to fill it out and give you like extremely realistic results. So having that utility gives you a nice bridge to different ways of approaching large scale scenes. Uh, continuing on with shading, we have hex tiling. So a very common problem when dealing with texture maps is that it becomes very obvious when the texture maps tile, when they, you can see that tiling very obviously. Um, that's true if you're doing UV mapping or you're doing you know, uh, triplanar mapping or anything along those lines. So what hex tiling does is basically allow you to have these hexagonal spaces, um, each that has its own orientation and scale. And so it really hides those boundaries. It can take simple data and make it look very complicated. So here you can see this UV grid, you know, which is literally, it's designed to be tileable. It's designed to look like one contiguous um, image. But even here, you're able to break it up nicely and create this organic feeling of a non-tiling image. So let's just take a look at, on uh, an actual complicated piece of geometry. So here you might, you know, you're probably going to want to avoid having to create UVs for, for this type of geometry. It's complicated, lots of little pieces, lots of intersections, all sorts of trouble. Um, and of course, a triplanar approach would work well here, but you might start seeing um, that tiling. Um, so here's the example. There's only three texture maps uh, on this image, but it's virtually impossible to see where the tiles intersect and where they overlap and where the tiling is actually occurring. So it lets you create the uh, illusion of complexity without actually having to have a complicated setup or shaders that use noise to blend with each other and so on. You can really jump in very quickly and get a kind of seamless result um, without a lot of work. And so then we can start you know, bringing all of these options together and Karma XBU is capable of rendering complex scenes uh, like this. So this is combining a whole bunch of techniques. You can see the sky field up above. It's also using the Karma Physical Sky, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, it's actually using uh, some ocean tools for the lake uh, there at the bottom. Um, and the vines are an interesting case because they are actually just curves. There's no dimensionality to them. We're using essentially a hair-like approach to create a uh, render time wrapper around those curves that we can still texture map. So you can actually add detail. So it's opening up a lot of interesting possibilities for things like trees, uh, or branching structures that you still want to texture map, which wasn't really possible until now. Okay, let's get into some workflow things. Um, so here we have the new material linker, or I should say an update to the material linker, um, which is basically a way of assigning materials to things in your scene. But we've now added a material catalog. So now we have this large catalog of materials for you to start with. 
um, you can easily pull them into your scene and you'll see that they actually end up as references down there in the bottom left of the scene graph tree. So you're taking material X uh, materials uh, and they are brought in as USD material X, which is very nice. And then you can use drag and drop. We've improved the drag and drop to let you be more specific about how the materials are being applied and just sort of interactively drag them in and out uh, of your scene. Um, but we also have access to the AMD material library. And so this is a, a repository of material X uh, materials, <laughs> uh, which lives um, on the internet. Um, so you can see that there are these um, images, these tiles that aren't quite there as I'm scrolling through, and that's because we're actually pulling them down live. Um, but they don't actually become uh, real materials in your scene until you instantiate them. So once you actually take this plaster material, for instance, and drag it into our uh, material list, that's when it's actually downloaded onto your machine and then you can apply it. So it's a really nice way of working in a lightweight way. Of course, if you wanted to, you could absolutely download the entire catalog and have it available right from the start. But it's nice if you're just playing around with shaders to, to just get things on demand. Um, we've also improved uh, uh, the interactivity of this rules-based approach where instead of dragging into the viewport, you're creating materials that have rules for which objects uh, use that material. It's still very sort of drag and drop, very artist friendly, but we just improved the overall experience here, um, especially when it comes to creating sort of a semi-procedural approach to assigning materials. So if I open up uh, one of the rules, I can still drag things from my scene graph tree right into the pattern here to apply to these supports. You can see slash supports, but in this case, we have supports in this scene graph tree and they're all in different places. So instead of doing it like this, we can actually just do some basic pattern matching to say anything called support. And at the bottom, if you look, you can see that we're previewing which primitives will get that. So you type the rule, you see a preview of what will come out of it. So if we go ahead and add another one with a slightly more complex pattern, you get a nice preview. So you're not guessing what is this going to apply to. As you're interactively working, uh, you can see the results. So that gets you up and running really, really quickly. And here's just an example of some of the materials uh, that are in the catalog applied to our test geometry um, shader ball. Um, so a missing feature from XPU, which is now available because we are uh, gold, our uniform volumes now available in XVU. This is just a little scene using a Karma fog box to fill up uh, this space with a uniform volume just for atmosphere's sake. Ta -da. <laughs> See? Ta -da. <laughs> I need to start saying that. That's what I should do when we, <laughs> when we get it. Ta -da. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, <laughs> and here's just another, another scene using uh, um, volumes for uh, snow. Uh, so yeah, we have this character walking through this particle simulation, which is then converted to volume. So you can see you get that sort of snow subsurface scattering effect with this large scale. Um, I think it was called a silly number of particles by the person who made this. Um, so it, uh, XP was very, very capable. Um, so I showed it earlier and I kind of mentioned it, but this is kind of demonstrating um, two things. One is our new cloud shader, which again helps get that sort of really scattered look that clouds exhibit, which is costly to render, but also the Karma physical sky lop, which is basically generates a plausible, plausible sky, sky colors, as well as direct lighting color, um, depending on the time of day. So you see as time of day changes, the lighting changes in sort of a believable way. So this is a great way to really quickly light exterior scenes or light interior scenes you know, via exterior lighting. Really, really nice, convenient um, tool. Um, we've also updated our first shader. Um, and specifically, we've basically are modeling what actually happens in hair for um, more um, accurately. Um, so there's something called a medulla, which is kind of a, an element that lives inside of the sort of a translucent casing. That's kind of how fur uh, works, and in this case, it's uh, giving us the ability to render more kinds of fur more realistically, especially sort of very soft, fluffy fur, which was very difficult to achieve in our previous fur shader, but now becomes uh, much more possible, as you can see all the different fur types on this uh, bison. 
Um, and luckily it also works quite well for feathers. So again, a very flexible um, shader for different types of creatures, giving you really, really nice results as you saw in some of Kai's demos earlier. Okay, let's get into procedurals. So we had an ocean procedural previously, um, but we've made a huge update uh, to this for Houdini 20. So we're just gonna start here first with a basic ocean setup, nothing, nothing fancy. We're just gonna bake out some foam particles. We're gonna write out to disk our ocean spectrum. And then we're gonna use that in a procedural. So if we jump back up to LOPS now, you can see we have a Houdini ocean procedural there. And as I render, our flat grid turns into a fully realized ocean at render time, which is great. Um, so very, very useful just as it is. But the problem with this and, and a lot of procedurals in general is you can't see it until you see it, right? You can't see it until you've rendered it. Um, and that's kind of a bit of a workflow killer um, uh, as an artist. So uh, for the ocean tool set, we have, pardon me. Uh, for the ocean tool set, we have the Houdini preview procedural. And you can see now, we can actually see in the viewport a preview of what the final result will be, uh, albeit at a lower resolution. So it's actually dicing based on the camera's viewport, sort of live as you're, uh, as you're working in the scene. You have control over the viewport quality, which then translates into IPR or sort of live render quality. And you can see it's fairly interactive. So if you're trying to time something to an ocean, or you need something very specific lighting, um, you can see it now more easily in the viewport. And you can see, you can almost scrub it to, to see different points in time. And here we're just changing some of the lighting to give you an idea of what you would get for your final, final render, which is really nice. So um, what if you wanted to, um, sorry, let me just go back. Here we go. Uh, so what if you actually wanted to write this out as USD? You're, you're done, you've, you've made your ocean, you're sending it further down the pipeline, you just wanna have a single file to deal with. So you write this out to USD and you're probably wondering, well, oh, but now I don't have those nodes anymore. I can't, I can't affect the setup, right? I've written this out to disk, now what? Um, so luckily, um, this is actually captured in the USD file. So I can actually sublayer in the exact scene I just made you can see I can still look through my camera. Um, and if I uh, tumble around, um, I can change my camera angle, that camera that is embedded in that original USD file. And I can still drop down a Houdini procedural um, and get the updated dicing and so on. And the dicing that you're seeing here, by the way, is an update to try divide. Um, it's about 10 times faster than the old one and has been updated to use the same kind of dicing uh, that Karma uses. So you get a very accurate result to what you would get if you did this purely inside of Karma. But more than that, the meshes now actually have a bunch of properties on them that can be edited. So I'm gonna change the preview quality, the one that was on that original node um, that no longer <laughs> exists here. And I can change that here using an edit, uh, an edit properties node. Um, and you can see that by editing that, I can still affect the preview. So even downstream from whoever did the initial setup, you still have some options to play with that to change how things are running in your scene live. So it's very powerful. And just finally, as you can see, it is at the end of the day creating geometry, right? Um, and that means it can be passed along to Karma, but it also can be passed along now to any renderer that can ingest USD. So that means you can use the Ocean Toolkit as it exists, and instead of having to bake out texture maps and displacement maps, which is what you would have had to do before, if you have a renderer that can ingest this, it can render it. So it's no longer locked to Karma as the Karma Ocean procedural was. And here is the result. Um, uh, and obviously it looks really nice. It uses all the tools. You can see the foam, et cetera. Really nice ocean, just as you would expect, even if you were not using the procedural. Um, and even though we've been showing mostly just sort of close-ups during this presentation, um, it does of course work with large scale oceans and ocean foam uh, and so on. So this is a, a very large, it's 
eight kilometers, I think, of ocean uh, rendered out here. So you can see that it still works just as it used to, but now with this added benefit of having this lightweight procedural running under the hood. Okay, so now we're, we're rendering things and we want to start getting some feedback. You know, artists love feedback on what they're working on live, and then it means render stats. So Kai showed this briefly earlier, but here it's running in the render gallery live as it's rendering. You can see the time changing up above. And now we have this nice visual look at all the statistics that are being generated for this render. Things like the number of rays, um, uh, how long dicing took, and so on. So just a nice way of working and getting feedback live as you're um, rendering. Um, but it's not just live. So if you were to write out an EXR, for instance, you can load it up into mPlay, and you still have access to those because we're saving this data in the metadata of the EXR file. So this was a Karma CPU render in this case. You can see there's more statistics here. Um, and these widgets are interactive. As you move your mouse around, things highlight. You see percentages. You see these graphs update. Um, so this is a really powerful way of previewing uh, uh, or sort of getting statistics about the render that you made maybe a little further down your pipeline. And then along that road, on that pipeline road, <laughs> um, let's move ahead. Here we go. Um, you can also bake those statistics into an output image. So this is actually part of this JPEG. Um, you can also generate what's called an HTML report, which is a highly detailed breakdown of all the statistics for your scene. So pipelines can pull this in and then have in any sort of reports are necessary. All the AOVs are here. Um, again, in this interactive way, you get all of your render settings saved here. So this is sort of the most complex. It's everything we can possibly give you um, export in this very convenient uh, command line tool at this point. Um, and so I think pipelines will be very happy to not only have these statistics while you're working, but also something that can travel down your pipeline alongside um, any imagery. So, workflow. Um, let's say you have a shot like this. You have multiple cameras in your shot, um, and you want to tweak the lighting and see how it looks across those cameras. Obviously, you can just switch between the cameras and see how things update. But we've created a new way of working, something called a clone. So I'm going to create a local clone of this scene. Uh, I can set the thread count for my machine so I don't uh, overload it. And what this is actually doing now is taking the scene graph that you can see here, um, the stage essentially, and um, cloning it. It's creating a live version of it that runs kind of in the background. So I can set this up now to the three cameras that I have in my scene. And you'll see these little thumbnails start to update as we're in the background rendering those. And then I can open that up into the render gallery, and I can preview those. So now they're rendering in the background the three points of view. Um, I like to use this stacked view so that I can see them all updating at once. But this is live. This isn't just sent off and rendered. As I make changes now, across my three camera views, I can see those changes immediately across being rendered, giving you a nice high fidelity preview of what's actually happening um, as you edit your scene. And you can see it's quite interactive. So we're pushing everything to the background, saving some of your CPU time for your interactive updates. So you're much freer to work uh, without having this sort of overloaded sense or having to constantly switch between cameras, which is really useful. But what about a true sort of multi-shot workflow? Like this is a little bit of a contrived example because every camera is looking at exactly the same thing. So here we've just created a network. We've already set up the clones, and we have these three branches. And I'm just using a switch to switch between them. And you can see they all update, which is nice. Um, that's you know, useful. You, know, you have per shot edits you can do. But right now, it's a bit cumbersome because I'm switching between uh, using a switch um, but let's replace that with a context option instead. So now I have a higher level way of changing that. But it also doesn't really make a lot of sense because my per camera edits are going to all the cameras, which doesn't make sense. But we can add the context option into the clone interface, and we can actually set which branch of this tree each camera is looking at. So now you can see I get completely different setups for each camera. So if you were working across time and space, essentially, um, you, can, you can do that. You can be looking at every one of your shots all at once in the same graph and all the renders at the same time, which is a huge 
workflow improvement. So you can see here as I edit one of the branches, the camera associated with that branch is the only one that updates. And so suddenly you're free to see uh, not just different camera setups, but entirely different shot setups. Um, well, let's look at a more complex scene, something that you know is much heavier. So we're back to this cenote. And now instead of a local clone, I'm going to create an HQ clone. So this is now running on the render fire. But again, it is live. So a common you know, desire for a shot like this is that I have lighting, but it's a long shot, and I want to see how the lighting affects you know, the end of the shot or the middle of the shot. So I can also say what frame I want to see in my clones. So as I do that and I start activating them, HQ starts rendering them on the, on the render farm and sending back the results. So now no processing is really happening on my local machine. I can interactively change lighting and across time I'm seeing the updates on these machines and getting the feedback live. So now we have sort of multi-shot, across time, distributed uh, rendering as you're working live, which I think is a huge boost to your workflow as someone who's lighting complex scenes like this. Um, by the way, all of these images also have render stats associated with them, if you did want to go in and look at these uh, live as it's happening. OK, let's move on to geometry, meshing, and terrain. Rob wasn't kidding when he said we were only a quarter of the way through. <laughs> uh, so but we're, we're, getting, we're getting there. It's a marathon. Uh, geometry, meshing, and terrain. So uh, a little while ago, we introduced something called uh, topo transfer. And topo transfer basically let you have um, a high-res piece of geometry, often a scan, maybe a sculpture, um, and then a low-res you know, renderable mesh, you know, so a nice mesh to be used with animation and so on. And we could create um, landmarks to say, you know, the eye should go here, the nose should go here, and then map the low-res geometry to the high-res geometry. Um, the issue is oftentimes you have lots of these, right? So you have all these different scans of this actor making these different faces, and you would have had to do that mapping manually between all of them. So this is a new node called TopoFlow. And what TopoFlow does is it uses optical flow to take your initial setup, look at the landmarks on the high-res mesh, and then deform it across time to match uh, those new poses. So essentially you do a single topo transfer setup identifying landmarks on the high res and the low res, and then this optical flow approach moves those to the correct places on these other images. It actually finds the same landmarks on these other poses and then deforms the mesh to that. So it allows you to sort of make a pipeline out of this approach instead of something that's sort of hand done for every single pose, and then eventually sent down, downstream probably to like a blend shapes or something like that. Um, Quad remeshing. So we've talked about quad remeshing uh, in the past, and it's now available in H20 um, in beta form. And I'll come back to that in a second about why it's in beta. But let's take a look at what is there right now. So here's a typical example. I've got a high-res sculpt, um, and I want to mesh it. You can see there's this pause as I drop the node, and then suddenly it becomes active again. And once that is cooked, you're now very interactively able to change the quad meshing. You can drag this slider, this is not sped up, you can just drag it interactively and change the number of quads very quickly. So there's sort of a, a hit as we generate a bunch of data, like the cross field and so on under the hood, and then it becomes almost an interactive tool where you can just easily decide um, how the mesh looks. We have options for how much it should follow the curvature, so you can see as I increase this, we start getting the polygons following more of the sort of flow of the geometry. Um, we also have the ability to get to that polygon count by subdividing the mesh or just by doing it straight and then projecting or reprojecting onto the underlying geometry, depending on how much you need it to match. Um, so here's just an example of the 16 million polygons uh, sculpt to a 15,000 polygon um, remesh. And you can see some nice results. The polygons follow the legs nicely. They follow the arms. You're not getting sort of twisting in a lot of places. Um, and this works as we increase complexity. So this is you know, 30,000 polygons, 60,000 polygons, and once you start getting up into 120,000 or so, you're starting to match you know, the high-res result um, quite well 
um, capturing all that detail. So you can kind of generate as much data as you like. Um, another um, feature, which is expected, um, is symmetry. <laughs> oh, symmetry, I just realized that. Uh, so <laughs> there's a, so typically when you when you uh, model something, you know, especially if it's going to be animated or so on, you will. Speaking of animation, okay. Once more. No, I lied. <laughs> Once more. Okay, here we go, okay. So typically things are modeled in this symmetrical way. So you wanna have your mesh, your underlying mesh that's generated be symmetrical as well uh, for optimizations and also just to make animation and things a little easier to deal with. So we have that option inside of here. And again, be able to quickly change that target count um, and get a nice result, a nice symmetrical mesh. Um, so all that's great and awesome, and you're very excited. So why is this uh, in beta, and why is this not just the release of this tool? Well, the reality is we know there are actually still a lot of hard problems to solve here. So we're pretty confident you'll find use cases for this as it is in beta, um, especially on sort of organic shapes like this sort of tree model. Um, however, we're lacking some features that are, we believe, required for this to come out of beta. One, there's currently no way to direct directly manipulate those cross fields to alter the, the uh, topology. So if you say, well, I want the quad flow to go this way, ideally you could draw a curve or something on the mesh and that would direct the, the topology that way. Um, so we're missing that functionality. We're also finding it's not really suitable for hard surface models at this point. Sharp edges, you sometimes get twisting along those edges. Those are problem areas. We really want to solve those. So again, we're holding this back to beta. Um, all that being said, this is proprietary um, technology. The algorithm is ours, so we have the ability to work with it and try and add these features. So we're holding this back. It is in beta, but that does not mean it's not useful for certain cases. So really, we're putting it out there. We want that feedback from you as we continue to develop uh, this tool. Um, so speaking of developing tools further, so this is our LiDAR import. Um, so in this case, it's a scan of this sculpture. So we introduced this new LiDAR node, I think in the last version, um, and it just brings in the point cloud uh, in a nice way, retaining whatever attributes are available on it. Um, where we've sort of moved is with, are now with some LiDAR utility. So a typical problem with any sort of scan data is deciding like, well, what's outside, what's inside, what direction is a surface facing? It's a very hard problem to solve when all you're given is you know, random points in some orientation that you don't really know. Um, so the point cloud normal uh, SOP can actually do quite a good job of determining what direction things are facing, which is critical um, when you get to uh, meshing of the point cloud. And you can see here we've, we've meshed that now. It's an adaptive mesh. So there's more detail in more detailed areas, less detail elsewhere, but you can see a very accurate uh, representation from that point cloud to, um, to the mesh. And again, here's just a close-up showing that ad adaptivity that I was talking about, where certain areas are more detailed um, than others. Um, sort of a side note, not really showing here, but oftentimes when you do scans like this, there are areas of the object you're scanning that are occluded, you know, that the scan didn't actually see. So there are holes in your point cloud. And we actually try really hard to identify those areas and still fill them in so you don't get holes in your final mesh. It actually will take a best guess of what might have been there in those areas uh, that you can't see. So nothing super sophisticated. It doesn't create detail out of nothing, but it doesn't leave you know, gaps in your mesh. Um, and then here's an example of doing a quad remesh on that uh, adaptive mesh that you saw uh, before. Yeah, so you can see, again, capturing a lot of that detail in a reasonable quad mesh. If you are eagle-eyed people, I'm sure you can see some places there where things aren't working as well as you might like. But still, for this use case, probably a reasonable result. Maybe you would use that to bake a high-res to low-res uh, texture map. 
Um, of course, another use case is uh, LiDAR for very, very large scale. So not models in your hands, but huge terrains. Um, and to help with that, we have point cloud reduce. So if you look at the stats at the bottom, we start with 154 million points, and we get that down to, well, varying amounts, but much, much like hundreds of thousands or, uh, instead, um, while retaining the detail. So point cloud reduce doesn't just randomly remove points. It tries to remove points in areas of high detail and leave points where they are in areas of low detail. So basically, it's a workflow enhancement. It lets you work with these uh, point clouds without having to struggle with these enormous point counts. Uh, but without hopefully losing the detail in your mesh, um, which you can see here that we've now um, meshed. So you can see that we do actually generate a nice mesh from this, capturing tons of the detail. Um, and then just using a simple attribute transfer at the end, you could take data from the point cloud, put it on the mesh, and then continue to work with this um, down the pipeline, depending on what you need. Maybe you want to get rid of the shadows or relight it in some way. So while we're on the topic of terrain, let's take a look at side effects labs. Um, so this is uh, sort of part of a larger terrain project that the folks over at side effects labs are doing, in this case, working with tileable or tiled terrains where you have lots of tiles and you need to bring them together, um, as well as this really interesting tool for creating road networks. So basically, you know, given a bunch of sort of waypoints, we figure out where roads would plausibly go between them. Um, and then we can use that data to then project them um, onto an actual piece of terrain and then using some nicer pathfinding, figure out where how those roads might move over the terrain. So, you know, you don't get silly things like roads going over mountains instead of around them and so on. Um, part of that tool set is also um, a setup for doing, uh, identifying, I should say, uh, biomes. Here we go. Um, so in this case, we're sort of segmenting the terrain to say like, this is a forest, this is a mountain, this is a, maybe a beach or a desert. Um, and then we use that in the actual generation of the terrain to apply the correct materials or maybe even scatter the right types of objects on that terrain. So it's a very common workflow when you're working with large scale terrains, especially if you're working in games, but even in general, um, that's true. So you can see here, uh, applying those materials, scattering the correct objects, depending on the biome that's been identified in that image on the left. Um, here we have an update to uh, our Mapbox importer that pulls in Mapbox data um, and helps um, align them and remove the seam so you get a more seamless result for your terrain, a really nice uh, utility feature. Uh, we've also updated how our tools work in Unreal Engine. So we've brought back the Houdini tool shelf, um, and that allows you to work in a more sort of familiar way, chain these together. Um, it also works natively with uh, World Partition, which is part of uh, Unreal's native sort of terrain generation. Um, and uh, we also have these <laughs> landscape splines, I'm going to call them. I think that's the right term, uh, which is the native way of dealing with splines inside of Unreal Engine. So now we're hooking into these native tools more so that you're not sort of always in a Houdini world or an Unreal world. You're actually allowing the tools to sort of speak to each other in a better, uh, more natural way. Um, so we're going to end off here with another terrain example. And you see this Onyx logo for the Onyx Inference Engine. And we're going to show you an update to an old demo that we did, I think, in Houdini 16. Um, that used PDG. So this is an older setup that we did where we import USGS map data and we created a sort of machine learning AI tool that would take curves and turn those into plausible terrains. Um, and so as we started coming back to machine learning, we were like, well, let's resurrect that project and see how it works now. Um, and we very quickly realized there's a lot of problems with this approach. Um, the biggest one being that you don't really know what's in that map data necessarily. It may not have the data that you want for the type of terrain that you want, um, or it might just be low res. You know, a lot of this data, some of it is high res, some of it is low res, so that can produce um, undesirable results um, down the road. So instead, we said, let's generate our own data. We're going to use Houdini to generate uh, terrain data using all the terrain tools that already exist 
in Houdini. So what you're seeing here is kind of a flipbook of just thousands of iterations of different kinds of terrain, running uh, erosion on them. So deforming a terrain, running erosion, using that as training data. So this isn't an ML image you're seeing here right now. This is just showing you the thousands of iterations of different terrains that were created in order to train uh, uh, the AI down the road. Um, so let's give you a, just a quick walkthrough of how this is set up. We create some attributes here. These are configuration uh, attributes that will be fed downstream. Then we generate the synthetic terrain data with PDG and TOPS uh, uh, using all of our typical terrain uh, tools. So you can see processing a height field, uh, processing the terrain, adding erosion, and so on. Um, so we just generate all those images. We add erosion, as I said, and then we create this segmentation map. And this is kind of the important part where we're figuring out what parts of the terrain are which, uh, mostly based on elevation in this case, but it could be other, other ways. And then we use those pair of images to train picks to picks or to use picks to picks or to train our ML model uh, with PDG to, again, now hopefully create an interactive tool. And so now you see texture mask paint that was featured heavily in Kai's demo being used to interactively just paint terrain onto um, basically a flat grid. So this is just taking that data, the AI, the machine learned output is generating this terrain in real time. So this is painted live, creating this plausible um, terrain for you to you know, work interactively. Um, and because we're still experimenting, we're like, well, what if we use the mesh instead of painting where we could just you know, maybe model this lattice into a generic shape and see the results. And you can see, you know, how fast you get a very nice, you know, plausible terrain result from modifying this, um, again, in real time as the uh, learned uh, features of this terrain are applied to our mesh. Um, also just using straight up height field tools. So now we're generating a height field. This is being layered onto an input. So we just have some generic height field noise and then we paint the detailed um, terrain aspects onto it uh, in this kind of natural way using height field paint. So we're starting to get really excited about the possibilities here. Um, and of course, these can be layered and layered and layered. So you can maybe do a base terrain, then paint uh, some ML on that, maybe do an erosion, then go back to ML and paint on top of that. So this is starting to turn into potentially a terrain tool set. Um, and as we mentioned before, you know, this is an example that we did, but we want it to be specific to what you need. So these are just sort of almost random settings for our erosion. Um, but by giving you this tool set, you can train your own types of terrain. So maybe you want an extremely realistic terrain all based on scan data. Maybe you want a cartoony terrain. You know, maybe you want an alien terrain. So instead of, again, a generic solution, which would only kind of give you one kind of result, we're putting that into your hands and say, train exactly what you need and then use that down the road. Uh, and as like our other machine learning examples, this is available on the content library. You'll be able to try this out, maybe swap in your own training data instead and see what kind of results you get. We're really eager to hear your feedback on this and that'll help us decide how these tools evolve over time. So, believe it or not, we are at the end. <laughs> it did have an ending. Um, and in fact, the ending is delayed a little bit because it's November <laughs> when Houdini 20 will actually be released. So just around the corner, uh, Houdini 20 will be released and you'll be able to try it out for yourself. So, uh, before we leave, I do want to make sure to thank the people who actually made the software, all of our developers, all of our TDs and artists, our UI designers, our technical artists, the documentation, all of our programming interns, everybody involved with this is vitally important to Houdini being successful. And that includes all of our alpha and beta testers because we thrive on feedback. You know, that's how we make our tools better over time is getting feedback from the people who use it, many of whom are here in the audience tonight. Um, and even though this was uh, a very long <laughs> presentation, there's still a ton of stuff we didn't even talk about. Uh, so here's just a long scroll of all the features of Houdini uh, 20. You can dive in. Uh, if when this shows up on la online later, I'm sure somebody's going to start screenshotting this and posting uh, exactly every feature that you see here in the scroll. But 
suffice to say, there's a lot of things happening here that we didn't have time uh, to talk about. So I hope you enjoyed what we showed. Um, I hope some of you get to the bathroom faster than others because I'm sure it's a long, <laughs> long line uh, on the way. Uh, and then of course, along with all those features, um, we want to talk about this foundational tool set for machine learning. That's going to be vital to the future of Houdini. So thank you very much.